Welcome back to World War II TV, folks. And following a conversation in another myth show, my guest today proposed we talk about Eric Hartman's claims in the air war. And it's something that we haven't really tackled on this channel for ages, exactly how aces are determined either in the air or in the ground. Anyway, we're going to look at that today. Daniel's book on German air aces in Hungary is in the description below, linked there. I'll bring him in now. Good evening, Daniel. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Paul, for having me on your show. So we're going to bring it up. You've got a PowerPoint um, where you're going to talk about Eric Hartman, the man, myth, legend, and we're going to let you hand uh, hand over to you for about 20 minutes or 30, 25 minutes to make your case. And then, folks, we may have time for some questions at the end. We'll see how it goes. Um, but basically, I'm going to hand over to Daniel to present his case. Wonderful. Thank you so much and welcome to the guests. I'll try to keep it short. So if anybody has questions, there should be some time at the very end. All right. Eric Hartman, man, myth legend. Um, for those that are perhaps unfamiliar with who this German pilot is, he flew for the Luftwaffe in, mainly in uh, Jagdgeschwader 52 in all three groups. He flew exclusively on the Eastern Front. He received uh, some of the highest awards that the Third Reich gave out, two of those personally handed over by Hitler himself. He survived the war and there's many interviews that you can find uh, about him online, which is cool. But his main claim to fame is his 352 claims that he made during the war. 352 uh, claims over enemy aircraft, most, most of those being Soviet, a couple American. Um, and that's his main claim to fame. And uh, after the war, you know, it's been about 80 years. A lot of his um, kind of like legacy has been shrouded in myths or myths have been injected, especially by authors that have written about him post-war. Those have turned into legends because they haven't been challenged for 80 years. Um, and now they're kind of set in stone, unfortunately. So hopefully with this presentation, I'm just gonna do a surface level dive and uncover some of those myths and legends. All right, so the very first thing that I'm going to start off with is something that is critical to the character of Eric Hartman, and that is his claims. Um, a lot of authors since the war have unfortunately done a poor job of defining their terms, specifically what a claim is, what a loss is, and what a victory is. Without these terms being defined, myths and legends started to grow around not just Eric Hartman, but about a lot of different pilots, not just from the Luftwaffe either. Um, and it, me, it leads to some very poor history being written. So let's begin by defining what a claim is. A claim is. A claim is nothing more than one person's account of what happened. Full stop, period, nothing more. That's literally all a claim is. Right. Now, a claim can be backed up by witness statements. Um, it could be backed up by pictures. It could be backed up by wreckages. But the claim itself is just one person's account of an event. Okay, now what is a loss? A loss occurs, uh, we're talking about losses to aircraft. So we'll use aircraft terms. A loss occurs when an enemy aircraft is either completely destroyed or it is put into such a state that the enemy no longer has access to it. So starting with the latter, if a enemy aircraft, let's say Air Cartman is, is fighting a, a yak and he, he kind of like shoots at him, the yak goes down and the yak belly lands on German held territory. Air Cartman didn't destroy the aircraft, but he put it into such a state that the enemy is deprived of use of that aircraft. He is able to claim that as a victory. Now, let's say that the Soviet plane belly lands on Soviet territory. Eric Hartman cannot claim that as a victory because it's very easy for the Soviets to put air bladders under the wings, bring in a flatbed truck, take the, uh, the yak back to a bow or rob unit. They can patch it up or a PARM-3 unit, send it back to the... the you know the airfield and it's it's ready to go in fact in my book verified victories we found i have a blur on so it's very difficult to see 
Um, we did find such a case in November where Eric Hartman, in November of 1944, he claimed a Soviet fighter. The Soviet fighter belly landed on Soviet territory. And within 24 hours, the plane was operational again. Now, you don't need to take my word for it. This isn't Daniel Warbath saying, oh, this is what a loss is. The Luftwaffe's RLM outlined that this is what a loss is. Right. Um, in the book, we wrote down what the directive is. It came out in 1941, and it explicitly states that pilots should not be claiming uh, enemy aircraft that barely landed on enemy territory because there's actually very little um, that the the people that check the claims can do to know if the plane is fully destroyed or not. Sure, it barely landed on the opposite side, but um, they can put it back into operational use. Mm. Um, you can think of like a Western Front example, uh, let's say a B-17 goes and bombs Hamburg, comes back, two engines are knocked out. Um, or take like Memphis Bell, right? The, the famous movie about Memphis yeah. Bell, it comes back, It's you think it's a write-off, but that plane can be put back into operational service. That plane is not a loss. Right. And so it should not be claimed as a victory. Um, and also, you cannot claim victories over aircraft that did not uh, become destroyed through your own means. So let's say that there's a ferry flight accident. Uh, the Luftwaffe can't claim a victory over all those planes that were lost uh, in ferry flight accidents, or they, they crash into the side of a mountain due to navigational error or whatnot. You can't claim those. So that or those three terms. They need to be defined. Uh, if you want a more elaborate explanation of what those are, it's in Verified Victories, the very first chapter, literally titled, What is a Victory? All right, moving on to the next one. Um, in 1944, Eric Hartman reached the 300 plus claim mark. This is an absolute world record at the time. He did this on August 24th of 1944. And this is, uh, a fact that is brought up many, many, many times uh, about people that write about Eric Hartman and it's praised and glorified um, and it's turned into a legend. So let's let's tackle this legend a little bit. And to do that, I'm going to back up a little bit before just to see the timeline of how things progressed in the East in 1944. All right, so the Soviets launched their summer offensive between June and August of 1944 they retake about 400,000 square kilometers. That means that the Germans lost about 400,000 square kilometers. That is absolutely massive. Operation Overlord in the Normandy campaign when they landed in France, that area of France occupied by the Germans, less uh, like Vichy France, that is about 400,000 square kilometers. That's how much territory was taken back by the Soviets. It's incredible it was an extremely uh, aggressive push that paid off okay so the germans lost about four hundred thousand square kilometers of territory they had to retreat from the black sea they were completely kicked out of ukraine like 90 percent kicked out of belarusia they're almost kicked out of the baltic states mm. um, parts of romania no longer in their control romania is preparing for an about face um, and later on, I think in September, Slovakia also goes into an about phase. So they're losing their allies. They're losing territory. They're losing access to open water. And the cherry on the cake, uh, which gets blasted uh, through Soviet uh, PR, is Alexander Pokrishin, a Soviet uh, ace. He is awarded his third Hero of the Soviet Union Award on the 19th of August. That date is important. The Germans know about this. I found German uh, reports where they interrogate Soviet POWs, and through the POWs, they know that Pokrishkin got his third uh, Hero of the Soviet Union award. So this is a known fact, August 19th. All right, let's bring Eric Hartman into the mix here. Eric Hartman uh, is in competition with a number of other German aces. Uh, to see who can reach the next highest level of claims. 
250 has been surpassed, 275 is being surpassed, 300 is the next big mark. Mm. The Luftwaffe pilots in the East that are, are in competition would have been Hermann Graf, uh, Walter Nowotny, uh, Gerhard Barkhorn. Nowotny is taken out of action. Uh, he's too precious to the Luftwaffe, so they don't want to lose him. So he can't really break past his 250 mark. He was the first to reach 250. Rawl is also taken back. Um, he's too precious to lose either, and he's kind of shifted over to the, the right defense. Uh, and then there's Gerhard Barkhorn. He becomes injured in the spring of 44. So he's out of action. So Eric Hartman has no competition. It is uh, it is a perfect opportunity to you know, reach up at that 300 plus claim mark. All right, August 23rd, 24th, he makes 19 claims in two days. 19 claims in two days, ladies and gentlemen, that is becoming, almost becoming a ace four times over in 48 hours. That's what we're talking about. Mm. It's an incredible rate of claiming, an impossible rate of claiming. Um, I've looked at the Soviet losses. There's simply not that many in that area. And what makes this even more incredible is that Eric Harman is the only pilot in his unit who makes claims. The only one. How convenient is that? Mm. Now, some historians have theorized that they were guarding Hartman and they let him make all the claims so he can get up to 300. Uh, I call BS on that completely. <laughs> the The losses are simply not there. So I don't care what, uh, you know, excuse gets pulled out of the bag. If you show me losses, I'll start believing. Uh, until then, I won't. Um, so how did this day go about? On the 24th of August, uh, in the afternoon at around like 2, 3 p.m., he makes uh, his final few claims that pushes him over the 300 barrier. Uh on the ground, JG-52 has a news reporter there, and they're huddled around a radio listening to the radio chatter from the pilots uh, out in combat. And they hear the German pilots yell, Abschuss, Abschuss, into their radios, which means shoot down. So they're making claims. And they use these words yelled through a radio as their confirmation. That's what they're using as their confirmation. That's it. No paperwork, no photos, no actually viewing the wreckages behind enemy lines. Just beyond the horizon radio calls. That's it. That's enough for them. Um, the PR people start going into overdrive. Uh, you can read about this in the book, The Blonde Night of Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. They they paint uh, like banners. They make wreaths. They get champagne. They get the video cameras and the, the photographers ready. They get all this stuff while Hartman is still in the air. Like that's how quick this confirmation is. Super convenient, super convenient. He lands, um, immediate celebratory uh, event occurs. There's even footage of Eric Hartman's plane rolling up. And uh, I think it's on YouTube, I'm not quite sure, mm. but the, you can find pictures of it. Um, and I was looking at those pictures today and the oil oil filler cap at the nose of the plane is opened. You're not you're not entering into combat with like opened hatches, especially for the oil uh, the oil system. Like the oil system needs pressure. If the cap is not on, there's no pressure. The engine stops. So it looks very much like instead of returning from a combat mission, they just taxied the plane around in a circle and took a video of it complete PR. Um, the following day, on the 25th, Eric Hartman gets a telegram from Adolf Hitler himself saying that congratulations on your 300 victories. So the Fuhrer labels them as victories. Uh, he gets congratulations and uh, then he gets an award. He goes home for September. Eric Hartman marries his, uh, his girlfriend returns back to a unit, a new unit that he gets to lead in October. Um, earlier in October, uh, there's a man from the RLM ODBL. His name is Oberst Loiser. I can't really pronounce his name. He's high up there in the uh, in the Luftwaffe. 
he signs off on the certificate for Eric Hartman's uh, award. So all that takes place. And the RLM gives its official confirmation in October, November. So two months after the event happened, uh, Romania is no longer in the picture. Like Romania is long gone. The front line has completely moved. There's no way to actually check if those aircraft wreckages exist. Hitler has already given his written approval. There's been a bunch of PR, there's photographs. The award has already begin, been given out. Are you really gonna go against all of that pressure if you're sitting in a cubicle at the RLM and say, yeah, there's not enough uh, information here to, to uh, verify these claims? Of course not. You're just gonna write off, yep, sure, good to go. Um, so that that is a, is a, a myth. Mm. Uh, that these like 19 claims actually resulted in victories. It's it's simply mathematically impossible. Um, and there's a lot of suspicious PR that happens uh, within that time frame. They also have to combat that the Soviets are getting new awards, right? Like uh, Alexander Pokrishkin, he just got his third hero of the Soviet Union. Uh, that was the highest award at the time, and he got three of them. And they had to make up for the fact that they're losing like 400,000 square kilometers uh, of territory. Uh, the home front needs some kind of comforting. And having a, uh, a young man's face in the newspapers with an award smiling, um, that's something that can help. All right, so enough of that myth. Oh boy, the bounty on Eric Hartman's head. Oh, I love this one. All right, so supposedly in some time in 1943, no one seems to know. A lot of these myths, by the way, Paul, nobody seems to know. Uh, yeah, you can't find you can't find where they start. They just suddenly they're there. Yeah, they're they're just there. Okay, so uh, supposedly some sources say Stalin himself, which is okay, whatever. Uh, supposedly, ten thousand rubles were placed as a bounty on Eric Hartman's head because he was a dangerous opponent, or some kind of silly jargon like that. Um, everybody's dangerous that's coming at you with a gun, right? So, oh, but how, Eric Hartman, he's super dangerous. Da, 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 da. <laughs> okay, so you have this supposed bounty. There's a big, big cash prize. Wow, ten thousand rubles. I wonder how the soldiers are going to spend that on the front, where there is literally nothing to spend ten thousand rubles. Mm. Anyway. Um, it requires you to positively identify the person who, uh, you, you know, um, who the bounty is declared for. How are you going to identify Eric Hartman when the closing speed of two aircraft is approaching like 800, 000, or 800 uh, kilometers of speed during combat? When you're, the piece of glass that you're looking through, the armored piece of glass is the size of an A4 sheet. Okay. Mm. Like, how are you going to identify him? There's, there's no freaking way that you're going to be able to identify Eric Hartman. And then again, can anybody please show me a single shred of evidence for this bounty? Nobody can, because it didn't exist. Moreover, the timeline for this bounty does not match historical events and historical facts. Um, yes, the Soviets did have monetary rewards for shooting down enemy aircraft listed in verified victories if you want to pick up the book you can go read about it in uh, 1941 the soviets declared that for each enemy aircraft shot down in air combat the soviet pilot will receive 1000 rubles so not 10000 1000 and for any enemy aircraft not specifically hartman okay so that's 1941 this bounty supposedly came in in 1943 there was another uh, monetary reward that came in in 1943, this time for 10,000 rubles. So, okay, we're getting closer to the story. Great. Uh, the only issue is that that was given to pilots that were able to destroy destroyers or submarines. Not enemy aircraft, not air carbon. So where this myth comes from 10,000 rubles specifically for air carbon, I have no idea. There's no historical fact for it at all. Um, yeah, it's, it's a complete myth that's turned into legend because it's not, you know, been debunked. I've done my part for it. I'll continue to do my part for it to debunking this because there's just no supportive evidence whatsoever. The next slide that I'm going to go to kind of ties into this as well. 
All right, beautiful. Eric Hartman's tulip-nosed aircraft. Um, a lot of like researchers and uh, authors would say this. This is what the Soviets were referring to when they uh, they meant Eric Hartman in the air. The planes with the tulip-nosed aircraft. The Black Devil of the South. The Black Devil of Ukraine. That kind of stuff. Um, again, utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. Um, why is it utter nonsense? Let's go through the the story from Eric Hartman's side. More specifically, the book, The Blonde Night of Germany, that talks about this. Right. Um, in 1943, sometime in 1943, Eric Hartman supposedly began flying his aircraft with a tulip, black tulip pattern painted onto the nose. Um, he was at the top of his game in 1943. He was shooting down Soviet aircraft after Soviet aircraft. And the Soviets kind of supposedly caught on to this plane being extremely dangerous. And then they, again, supposedly somehow made a connection with Eric Hartman and the Black Nose plane. And they said, you have to watch out for this plane because it's super dangerous. Eric Hartman's score started to decline because the Soviet pilots were apparently avoiding him. And... Um, he couldn't get his claims up. How is he going to reach 300 and beat all the other German pilots if he can't shoot down Soviet planes? So then he gives the pilot, uh, the plane to a different pilot. He takes a plane that doesn't have the tulip nose pattern. His claims start to increase. And then when he's comfortable with the rate that he's claiming at, he takes back the tulip nose plane and continues flying the tulip nose plane. So let's hit that stupid myth with some real facts. These are the three planes that Eric Hartman flew that had tulip noses. Look at the dates. Fall 44, not 43. February 45, not 43. And April 45, not 43. From the fall 44 until the end of the war, i.e. with no breaks, he didn't stop using the tulip nose plane. It was tulip nose plane until the end of the war. Right. Um. Okay, let's say two planes are coming head on at each other. What, you're the Soviet pilot. What do you see head on coming from the very first plane? You see a black nose. That's literally it. You don't see a tulip. Yep. Yep. You just see the nose cone. You don't see the tulip. When we look at profiles, oh yeah, it's beautiful. I can, I can see it. But when you're coming head on, you don't see anything other than the nose cone. When you look at the second one, what do you see? A white cone. When you look at the third one, what do you see? A black cone. So if it's a head-on engagement, you don't see the tulip at all. Now, Eric Hartman, he did not prefer to go head-on. His main style of attack was from below and behind. Um, a lot of the books write about this. In fact, uh, some of his colleagues in GG52 were asked about uh, what their tactics were. And they said that, yeah, this was actually the tactic that the unit used, not just Eric Hartman. They, they took it on from him. And they, uh, they made claims this way. So if somebody's coming at you from behind and below in a sneak attack, how are you supposed to see what pretty paint job the nose of the plane has? You absolutely can't. You can't even see the plane, let alone the nose of the plane. So this like myth that they can see the plane and they're scared of this tulip makes no sense. They can't see it. Um, Eric Hartman did not shoot down the number of planes that he claimed. So there's no reason to be scared of him. He's a very good pilot, but he's not like a god or anything. Mm. He's just a good pilot. And the Soviets have good pilots too. I mean, just uh, jumping in very quickly, given mm -hmm. that British and American soldiers in Normandy and Italy had trouble distinguishing between a Mark IV tank and a, ti and a Tiger, you know, at the speeds tanks move at, to, to think that anybody can really get a yeah. grip on the markings of aircraft that, as you say, are doing the speeds they're doing is, is when you think about it, it just, it's ridiculous. Exactly. And kind of leapfrogging off your point there, Paul, um, I've read about like over 10,000 uh, Soviet documents, uh, legit over 10,000. My hard drive is almost full. <laughs> um, the Soviets had a very unusual and like, they just couldn't really identify the planes that they were fighting against. Um, I write about this in uh, my co-author book, Verified Victories, but 
they can't really distinguish between a Falk wolf and a Messerschmitt. Yeah. Um, now, a Falk wolf has a large radial engine, whereas a Messerschmitt kind of has like a smaller inline engine. So when you look at a profile side by side, you're like, they're obviously two different planes. The Soviets, they can't seem to distinguish between the two. Now, there's a couple reasons for it. Um, number one, it could be that they were also fighting against the Hungarians over Hungary. So the Hungarians painted their aircraft different. And maybe the color of the paint threw them off. It was like a lighter shade. And so they they assumed that it was a Falkowulf. Another thing uh, could be that it was actually more prestigious to claim a Falkowulf as shot down. When we go to the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe overclaimed the number of Spitfires that they shot down. Hmm. They claimed a lot of hurricanes as Spitfires. Why? Because it was more prestigious. It was more sexy. It was uh, a better you know, move for your career to shoot down Spitfires than hurricanes. Hurricanes did more damage in the Battle of Britain than the Spitfires. But yet they were claiming Spitfires because that was that was the thing to claim. Same yeah. on the Eastern Front. The Falkowulfs were extremely dangerous because they had many weapons, but they were also extremely dangerous for the ground troops because they were dropping bombs, they were firing rockets, they were strafing columns. Um, and the air war over the East was focused uh, to cover the ground troops. So there was very, very good communication between the ground troops and the air forces. And so if you could take out air units that harmed your ground troops, that was much more important than shooting down some high flying recon plane or yeah. just some Messerschmitts in the air. You have to shoot the things that harm you. Um, so yeah, like they came in and identify a Falkowulf versus a Messerschmitt. How are they supposed to identify Hartman's tulip nose plane? Yeah. And one final thing that I'll uh, put up and then I'll end with this. Um, I'm going to show a couple pieces of aircraft aluminum. Um, these are from Diggs that I, uh, I dug up in Hungary. I have a blur on, so unfortunately some of this gets dug out. So that was blue. This is... Um, there you Sorry, hold, hold, yeah, hold it in front of your head. The blur doesn't work, yeah. Yeah, right. there we go. There's some of that. And then here's yellow. Mm. High contrast, even against the bare aluminum. Um, in the Soviet reports, the only color that I've ever seen mentioned um as it like a recognition marking for enemy planes is yellow why is that because in fall winter and spring when uh the landscape is literally 50 shades of gray that's yeah. all you see is different shades of gray yellow is a high contrast color that's what pops out when you're yeah. closing at 800 kilometers an hour that's all you see is oh a flash of yellow a flash of white or something you don't see black and black given that that's the that's the color of oil streaks and smoke and yeah. and holes would also appear to be black so you know black is the last color you'd think you better observe on an aircraft moving at speed exactly exactly all right so with that i will close down my presentation well brilliant stuff and um, we have got a few questions as i knew there would be so I'm, 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 we'll, we'll power through a few of them so sure we're going back to that you know those 19 kills in 48 hours um what could he have been shooting down what was in the air potentially if there was anything in the air at that time Definitely fighters, yaks, and air cobras. Okay. Um, but it's not 19. Not mm -hmm. It's definitely not 19. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he did ID the aircraft uh, correctly. That was what was in the air. But they didn't come down, at least not in the quantities that he claimed. And do we know how many, uh, the second question, do we know how many sorties he did actually fly? Are there records of how many he flew in that period? Within those 48 hours, um, I did a calculation on this. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I think it's it's close to uh, like 10 over okay. those two days. He was flying like an average like four. So you're going to get two kills per sortie on average. Minimum. Minimum. minimum yeah yeah Bear, uh, and and Bear, that's you know including the targets you're shooting at that you don't hit and yeah so so a couple more questions gun cameras no gun cameras no on the eastern front extremely rare um they would install cameras into planes however those would be like recon planes and their only purpose was to fly over a designated objective take pictures and go back uh the Luftwaffe didn't really have that many gun cameras um 
usually it was like 16 millimeter footage that they would put in the wings. Uh, they would like remove a cannon and then put the um, the camera in. Uh, but no, they didn't have uh, cameras. And then Paul Scott is asking, did Hartman personally claim all these kills or was it more the propaganda that Hartman went along with? Just wondering, no dividend in the end, but looking at the process, you know, I mean, you know, what was he like as an individual? Did you think he was kind of swept along by things or was he doing, was he leading the sweeping, so to speak? Yeah, well, that requires uh, actually meeting him. I haven't met him, yeah, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not that, <laughs> not that old. But um he the the highest number that i've seen in german documents is 350 and that is april 17th 1945 right so i i have no doubt that he actually claimed 352 um but he definitely did not destroy 352 enemy aircraft why these claims were so high um can you even fault these young men they're 20 something. They just want to go home. If you claim 300, you get a week's leave because you got an award. Yeah. C can you fault them? No, no, you can't. Back then, this wasn't like, oh, some historians are going to like nitpick apart all these claims individually. It, it's, it's like the amount of Americans I've met who claim they, they nearly got a trial with whichever the big team is near them, like baseball, football, whatever. You think. If everybody who said they could, uh, the same Brit, to Brits as well, Brits, so I nearly got a trial with Chelsea, Manchester United, whoever it would be. And you think, well, did you? Or was there one scout possibly at a match who watched 22 players run around and, you know, it wasn't even you were they're looking at. So, you know, we all we all use a certain amount of um, exaggeration to impress people, to try and whatever, make ourselves look better. But, you know, my, my question is going to be, as as an aviation historian, you and your father, the work you do, are we a bit stuck with the fact that these pilots from all sides have been so idolized for so many generations now? There just isn't really a desire to unravel all this mythology. People don't they don't really care. The people who love aircraft and they love aces, they don't they don't want their myths uh, broken. Do you think? Can I use that for my next book, Paul? Because that is exactly what is going on. Um, they've idolized them. Uh, for better or for worse, I think it's kind of inappropriate to idolize these people. Um, there's better things to idolize. Now, if you have like a relation to them, sure, like grandpa did something heroic or he did a great feat way back when. Um, but if you don't really have a relation to them, me personally, I don't see the reason to idolize them. Um, but yeah, it's it's been unchallenged for 80 years. The legends have been set in stone and it's an uphill battle to kind of break these molds apart, erode the the myths that have been created. And part of these myths, they're not even coming from Eric Hartman or other pilots. It's post-war myths. People yeah. had um, like knowledge gaps and they wanted to fill those gaps. So they created stories to sell books and they didn't do research. And so they, they theorized like, oh, he had this pretty paint scheme. So they must have been scared of him because when I look at a page, I can I can clearly see that this is Eric Hartman's plane. Soviet yeah. Palestine. And all and all the maths has been rounded up more than once. So you know, 22 has been rounded up to 25, then the 25 gets rounded to 30, and people say, oh, well, he might as well put 50. And so a couple of people have asked you to kind of, you know, what if you had to put your finger on it, so uh, what do you think the more likely number of claims is? So Andreas is saying, can Daniel give an estimate of what he thinks Hartman shot down? And Jeff is also saying, would it be fair to shave 50 to 100 kills off the 352 accredited to Hartman? I know it's in, almost impossible to, to work this out, but, you know, and not just Hartman, the other people as well. What would you say to that? Well, Kind of a nasty response is I'd say pick up verified victories page 200 and you can read about it there. Perfect. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give it in uh, percentages if that's all right. Um, yeah. And the methodology for how we arrived at these percentages are in the book. Um, don't get mad, but this is it's kind of embarrassing. Um, it's between you can believe between 21 and 32 percent of the claims for Hartman. That's wow. how bad it is. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, which, Where which, I, other pilots are 90 plus percent with the same Soviet documents. So there's nothing wrong with the Soviet documents. It's just right. that the, some German claims are completely off. Why they're off? If they made the claim in good faith and they peeled away and they didn't see the enemy aircraft crash into the ground and burn because they had more important things on their mind, like arriving home safely. 
or if it was like a made up story, I really don't have the capability to decide. All I can say is there's no loss for it. Yeah. And so- well, basically what we did is, as we said at the beginning, we are, we're, we're starting to peel away this whole idea of aces and hits and counting and claims. And as you said, there's a way of it being officially recognized. Uh, but since then, as you say, that, you know, the, the damage was done in the war with the propaganda machine then. And the second lot of damage has been done repeatedly in the 80 years since in the historiography by people kind of trying to sell books, trying to make YouTube videos, trying to sell documentaries and, uh, a book about aces uh, that running into hundreds of kills sells better than an ace that's got three kills because he wouldn't be an ace exactly. if you only got three kills. So there we are. It's been a fantastic debut performance. People are already saying in a sidebar to invite you back to to, to to peel some more layers on other aspects. The air war in Hungary generally hasn't been covered very much. There's other German aces we could tackle. But meanwhile, it's been a fantastic debut performance. I remind people the link to Daniel's book is in the description below um, and you can you can find it at your local bookstop. But um. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Dan. It's been really great. Thank you so much. And folks, we're back in 10 minutes' time with a second myth. We're looking at Zhukov. Uh, Georgi Zhukov, is he the Soviet's greatest uh, general in World War II? But meanwhile, I will see everybody in 10 minutes' time. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye now.